Welcome, Marcus. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, I'm going to let you take it, take it forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marcus, and I'm super uh, excited to be with you all today. Grateful for, for the time. I'm coming to you live and direct from Detroit, Michigan. Well, southwest of Detroit, Michigan, a little known place called Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is the home of the Raw School of Business, University of Michigan, where I, I am a, a marketing lecturer. But per, per the intro, you know, I have the fortunate pleasure of having one foot in academia and one foot in practice. So I get to put ideas in the world as an advertiser and put people in the world as, as an academic, which I, which I think is a, is, is, is a really, really great uh, privilege that, that I have. And over the course of my career, I've had a chance to work with a lot of brands across a wide spectrum of industries, which I hope provides a bit of perspective um, along the way. And while I got a chance to put like cool things in the world, which is nice and you know, I'm proud of, the thing I'm most proud of, of course, are my little girls, uh, Ivy and Georgia, who I talk about all the time, but that's probably all you'll hear about them today, at least. So let's talk. We, uh, you know, we got about an hour together and what I'd like to do is try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so for some of you folks, you may not want like this so much, but if you could put your cameras on, that would be awesome. So we can make this as conversational. I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot, but I might cold call you if I need to. So I wanna see faces if we can. All right, so let's do it. And I'll start with the question, you know, why, why are we here, right? Why, 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 are, why did you sign up for this thing, for this, this session? You decided to spend an hour with me. Why are you here? Well, why are we here? What do we got? See, I will cold call you if I have to. Don't make me do it. I'll do it, I'll do it. Somebody, anybody. I'll do it. Ellen, why are we, oh, Mary, Mary, you just saved Ellen because she was up, Ellen. <laughs> Mary, Sorry. why are we here? Um, so I'm a freelance writer, and I think it's um, one of my genres is education um, that I'm writing in. And so I'm really interested in seeing how teachers are marketing themselves and just kind of even just learning general marketing strategies. So, cool. and I'm like, super, I just love this conference. It's so cool. cool. So, hi. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Great to have you. Ellen, you're, I said, I didn't know you were on your Peloton bike. I wouldn't have. No, uh, I'm on the treadmill in the basement. <laughs> even better. Even better. All right. So I'll let you, I'll let you be. Ellen, you're off the hook, Ellen. You're off the hook. You're putting in no, the work. I'll tell you what I'm here, but I'm Oh, right, so Ellen. <laughs> um, Why are you here, Ellen? I'm the director of marketing and communication for a college at a university, and I'm curious to hear how to get people more excited about or understand the aspect of what I do or how we can talk to each other better because um, marketing is part of what we do. Amen. Professor T, how about you? Lakers fan, it looks like. Those are authentic jerseys from Showtime, my friend, with signatures. You better put some respect on it. Okay? <laughs> I'm a Detroit guy, man, so uh, there's going to be a little bit of tension. <laughs> Listen, there's Cooper, Rambus, Magic, Kareem, you're missing, and Worthy, all signed. But and it's awesome because all, all of those stuff. guys got beat by uh, the, 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 uh, the bad boys, so it's all good. Yeah, but again, how many times, though? Forget Zeke. Okay, but that we'll move on. We'll so move you on. and I will connect later, but <laughs> I'm really suggesting to you that I understand as an MBA uh, the power of brand. Yeah. And I'm interested in building a brand because, uh, you know, my institution, whatever. I got tenure, okay? Yeah. And I'm here to bang on my institution. There I'll you be go. clear. Tenure comes with some privilege, and I'm right. using that privilege. And I'm interested in building my personal brand more so than building and uh, being on lipstick patrol for my campus. I love it. I love it. So I, 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 I'm grateful. Thank you so much for sharing. So look, you know, the, the topic of this talk of this session is demystifying marketing for academics, which to me says, how do you make something simple for people who love to make things complicated, essentially? Right. Like, how do we simplify something that's abstract and somewhat ambiguous for people who like to make things very complex? All right. So everybody's with me. Yes. Thumbs up with me. Yeah. For those having cameras on, Pam with me. Thumbs up. Sweet. Press with me. All right. Bet. So the first question we had to answer is like, what exactly is marketing? You know, marketing is one of those words that we use often. We experience it as consumers. Some of us engage ourselves in it. Some of us have studied it as MBA students or undergrad students. Should some of us even teach it? What exactly is marketing? So we're going to find some definition for marketing. We might as well start with 
perhaps one would argue, an authority on the space. And that's the American Marketing Association. We would think that they'd have a operationalizable construct, some definition for, for marketing that we could perhaps use. And here's how the AMA defines marketing. Marketing is an organizational function, a set of processes for creating, communicating, and delivering value to consumers and for managing consumer relationships or customer relationships in ways that benefit the organization and its stakeholders. Now, I don't know about you all, maybe I'm just dumb and slow, but when I see that definition, I'm like, well, what are we talking, what exactly is marketing? Like, what exactly is this thing here? It's not very clear to me at all, which is probably why 10 years later, the American Marketing Association truncated that definition to this. Marketing is the activity, set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. Better, it's a better definition for sure, but still not entirely clear. So maybe institutions aren't the keeper of said knowledge. Maybe the AMA isn't the place to go. Perhaps we should look at the practitioners, right? As a practitioner, I have a bias towards the people who actually do the thing that we want to talk about. So let's look at what practitioner says. Well, if you ask practitioners, if you ask seven practitioners, you get 14 different answers for marketing. Like quite literally, there are tons of different definitions for marketing. Well, maybe there is a practitioner that is more credentialed, more, uh, has more credence when it comes to, to marketing than the others. And if that were one, if there were one individual, his name would be Philip Kotler. Philip Kotler, he literally wrote the book on marketing. If anyone's taught marketing or taken marketing at a business school, most likely you read a Philip Kotler textbook because this is the guy, he is the goat when it comes to marketing. And here is how Philip Kotler defines marketing. For Philip Kotler, marketing is defined as such. It is at the science and art of exploring, creating, delivering value to satisfy the needs of a target market at a profit. Marketing identifies unfulfilled needs and desires. It defines, measures, qualifies, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you've got to be a rocket science to figure out what the heck is Philip Collar talking about? Good grief. I just want to know what marketing is. Well, clearly, there are a lot of blurred lines, abstractions, jargon, and buzzwords that we need to get by. And me, I like things radically, radically simple. It's not until we get to radical simplicity that I believe that we can scaffold more complexity. But we need some simplicity. We need some simplicity. So let me give it to you simple. What is marketing? When I think about marketing, I go to the Oxford English Dictionary, arguably uh, the edition that was the, one of the most early times that marketing was a part of the English vernacular. And this is how the Oxford English Dictionary defines marketing. Marketing is to sell or bring to market. Whew. Whew, that's just so pithy and nice and simple. Marketing is to sell or bring to market. Well, I love that. That's simple enough for my little pea-sized brain. Marketing is to sell or bring to market, but it doesn't go without another question. It begs another question. Well, what exactly is the market? Now, if we're talking to economists, economists would say, oh, the market is the place of exchange where people go to maximize value. And I'm not an economist, but I hear that and say, okay, economists, I, I hear you, economists, which makes sense because marketing actually came out of economics, right? It was the, it was the practice of economics is what marketing was referred to in the early days. But okay, economists, I beg this question for you. If no one is in this location, is it still a market? Right? We don't know it's sort of like this, this esoteric question. If a tree falls in the forest, does it make, no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? But like, if no one is in that place, is it a market? No, it's a geography. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an empty parking lot, right? It's people that make up the market. The marketplace is the location where people come to exchange. But the market is people. When we talk about market demand, we're talking about people demand. We talk about market reaction, we're talking about people reaction, right? We talk about market activity, it's about the activity of people. Which means if the market is people, then this idea of, of marketing is to sell or to bring to market, to go to market, then marketing is going to the people. If marketing is to go to market and the market is people, 
And marketing is going to the people. Marketing is going to market. Pretty simple, eh? You with me, yes? Thumbs up if you're with me. Yes, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, sweet. All right, marketing is going to market. Now, that's the easy part, right? That's the easy part. Marketing is going to market, got it. We got language that we can use and we can talk concretely when people are using jargon and buzzwords that's nonsensical. We could say, and we just start going to market here. What y'all talking about, All right? Marketing is going to market. But then it begs another question. Well, what's the purpose of marketing? What's the purpose of going to market? Why do we go to market? Dr. Hayes, why, why do we go to market? He just turned his computer off, his camera off, because he knew about the call. He felt my, he felt my Jedi <laughs> vibes about to, about to call on him. Dr. Hayes, why do we go to market? Why do we go to market? Um, we go to market because two things. First, we want people to try to see what we have to offer. I'm yep, thinking. Um, and, another, and another reason why is because um, we can also learn from the people from those markets, so they're giving us feedback. So not only yeah. showing the product, but we can also get the feedback from that product. And then we able to improve what we want to give to the people. That's my point. Right. So we go, we go to market to say, yo, I got the dopest, I got the dopest uh, products on the market. Fam, look at what I got, right? So we show off what we got. And then we learn from, from the market. Sweet. So if I hired Pam to be my marketer, I say, hey, Pam, I want you to head up marketing for me. Your job is to show people what we got and then learn from the people. And if Pam come back to say, hey, Marcus, I showed everybody what we got and I learned a lot from them. Did Pam do a good job in marketing? But, well, uh, Katie, you say no. Why no, Katie? Um, you would then have to adapt and go back to the people with what they are asking for or find a middle ground between the two. So say Pam says, hey, Marcus, they don't like this about your product. They don't like that. You need to do this. And I say, okay, I'm going to go do that. And then we go, we go back to market, go back to the people with our stuff. And then Pam learns some more stuff to tell me more stuff. Does that help me? Does that help my marketing? Mary says kind of sort of, why so, why kind of sort of Mary? Um, so I think it's because you, there's only so much that you can do. It's kind of like uh, what's that phrase like good is better than perfect type of thing so you yeah. can tinker and tinker and tinker until you get something um like perfectly but like there's it's good to have a, an amount of feedback but it also you have to stay true to your why and you have to stay true to the crooks of why you're um promoting something and if the if the people don't actually like purchase or utilize your service or whatever it is that you're going then how success like maybe you learned but did you like actually like sell what you were trying to sell or yeah. give what you're so trying to if, give if i hire pam to do my marketing and pam and i say hey pam how much did you sell she was like i didn't sell nothing but i learned a lot i'm like uh pam exactly right so there, there's something more than just learning and showing off our stuff right so mary says we got to sell things right but what if I go to uh, what if I go to Sharice and say, "Hey, Sharice, uh, I'm running for mayor of Detroit. I want you to do my marketing. What do I want Sharice to do for me? What do I want her to do? What's her What's her objective?" Are you asking me? Yeah, what's your? I'm hiring you to do marketing for me. I'm running for mayor. What do I want you to do for me? What do I want you, you to want do? Want me to get you votes so you can actually become you mayor? Exactly. So sometimes marketing is more than just selling things. Sometimes it's getting votes. Right. Or, or say Nora, um, I, I go to Nora and say, Hey Nora, I, um, I'm, I, I, I'm starting a website. I need you to help me with the marketing. What do I want Nora to get from me? Visits, clicks, track, traffic, right? So what we're getting at here is that the core function of marketing is more than just showing what I got, telling people what I got. It's more than just getting information. It's more than just selling things. Cause sometimes I want votes. Sometimes I want clicks. Sometimes I want, uh, I want people to come to my party. Sometimes I want people to join my, to, to sign up for my class, enroll for my class. Marketing at its core, it's all about behavioral adoption. As marketers, our job is to get people to move. Don't drink this, drink that. Don't go here, go there. Don't buy his, his shoes, buy my shoes. Don't go see her movie, go see my movie. Don't vote for him, vote for her. Don't go to his website, sign up for mine. Don't don't take that class, take my class. Don't go to that university, come to my university. Everything we do as marketers is in an effort to get people to adopt behavior. 
And there's a wide spectrum to what that behavioral adoption might be. Sometimes it's to buy things. Sometimes it's to sample things. Sometimes it's just to, it's to research things or to share it or to watch. But ultimately, we are driven by the objective of getting people to move, influencing people to adopt behavior. All the executions that we do, these are just tools to get people to move. The advertising, even the product itself. Like I like that about Pam's, I, uh, Pam's definition, well, purpose is that I wanna go learn and I go and make product, right? And, but I'm making that product to get people to do what? To adopt a behavior, to exchange, right? I'm making music, I'm making, I make a movie, so I want people to go watch it, to exchange their attention, right? Everything we do is in an effort to get people to move. Right? And one philosopher, one great professor among us in our, in our high ranks of academia, his name is Professor Andre Benjamin, also known as Andre 3000. He says it this way, if you don't move your feet, then we don't eat. So we like neck to neck, right? If people don't move, we don't win. If people don't move, we don't become mayor. If people don't move, no one goes to our website. If people don't move, then no one's in our, 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 no one enrolls in our class. Everything we do is about getting people to adopt behavior. If they don't move, they feet, then we don't eat. So we like neck to neck. Makes sense. Yes, with me, yes? Thumbs up with me. I need thumbs, I need thumbs. I'm, I'm constantly in need of, of assurance. I know, my wife and I argue about it all the time. I need assurance. Okay, so you're with me, right? So marketing is going to market. Now here's the next question though. Is marketing optional? Is it optional? Can I choose to not market? What do you think? Mary, can I choose to not market? You can. Um, you can choose to try to rely on something like word of mouth, maybe. Um, and you, I think, I don't know if you ever have an active choice of not marketing. Like you can inactively choose to a certain extent because you have to spread word somehow. Um, and that might be through various passive channels but i don't know is, is spreading word necessarily going to market no so if marketing is going to market is no because then you have to uh no because it, no marketing is not not an option <laughs> so but i so i would argue <laughs> that marketing totally is an option you could decide to make money or not oh true you could decide to be true or not you could decide to value. Say, I don't want anybody to come to my class or not like, or the idea of it, this is, and I, I, I set you up for that perfectly, purposefully, because we tend to think about marketing as the executions. It's the messaging, it's the, the ads, it's the flyers, it's the emails, it's all the tactical things that we do to communicate. And that is, we think about marketing as a shortcut for marketing communications. But marketing at its core is about going to market to get people to move. To Mary's point, sometimes people go to market without doing a lot of or any marketing communications. They rely on word of mouth to go, people to go preach the gospel on their behalf, right? But if marketing is going to market, you can choose to not go to market, which means you could choose to not launch your website. You could choose to not sign up, you know, get your name on the ballot. You can choose to not throw a party. You can choose to, to not create a product. I, I, I tell um, students this all the time, you know, they're like, yeah, man, you know, I'm beats. You know, I, I got these, I got, I got some hot fire, man. I'm like, oh, where can I hear your music? Well, I haven't put it up nowhere. It's like, oh, then you don't make beats. Like, you're not a beat maker. You, you're not a producer. You're a hobbyist. Like, th that's what you are. If you don't put your stuff in the world, that's a hobby. The difference between a farmer and a planter or a gardener is someone who takes their stuff to market, right? Marketing is going to market. You can choose not to go to market and make no money, right? You can say, I had this idea for a class, but I never actually offer the class. I never actually go to market. So no one's gonna go to the class because it doesn't exist, right? So when we think about going to market, we have to ask them a few questions. If marketing is about influencing behavior, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do we want people to do? What is the actual behavior we want people to do? So for instance, here's a, a, a bad example, but it was the only one I thought about before the, today's session. So we have to just deal with it. Um, so say we want to get people to start drinking almond milk, right? We, want, we, we think that almond milk is a better substitute for people who are lactose intolerant and blah, blah, blah. Like it's just better, right? Almond milk, that, that, is, the, that is the objective. We want to get people to start drinking almond milk. Well, the first, the second thing we have to identify after we identify the objective is say, well, what are they currently doing, 
why when they start drinking almond milk, are they drinking regular milk now? Are they not drinking milk at all? Like it's not, it's only something they add into their cereal or they use it as creamer in their, in their coffee, but they don't drink it like a drink. Like what are they currently doing? And we have to understand what's the current behavior if we are to change behavior, if we are to influence behavior, even if the behavior changes to do more of a thing. So say we want people to eat, you know, two burgers a week, but they only eat once a week. So we want them to do more of what they're currently doing. It is still behavioral adoption that we're designing for. The third question we ask ourselves is, well, what's keeping them from moving? What, are they, what do we want them to do? What are they currently doing? What is the delta that's keeping them from adopting the behavior? What are the challenges? So in the instance of, of almond milk, maybe the challenge is that people think that almond milk isn't real milk and it's probably disgusting. I, I'm not passing judgment, but I'm just saying that that may be a hurdle that the people can't even, there's no, there's no cognitive legitim legitimacy around drinking almond milk, so they don't even try it. They won't even try it because cognitively it just seems so preposterous to them, right? That is a hurdle that we'd have to overcome if we want people to adopt behavior. And then we think about, so how might we overcome that obstacle? That's when the creativity starts to come. That's when we think about messaging or the kind of product or the packaging or the partnerships that we use, the sponsorships, or maybe how we get to them, how we get them to sample it. That's when all those executional things come together. But it starts off strategically thinking, what are they currently doing? Well, what do we want them to do? What are they currently doing? What is that delta that's keeping them from doing it? What are the hurdles? And then how might we remove those hurdles? Make sense, yes? With me, yes, yes, yes. So, now, it's all well and good. Like that, I, I, that's how I approach work as a practitioner. Um, and that's what I, I teach, right? We want people to move, great. What do we want them to do? What are they currently doing? What's the Delta? How do we close the Delta? But you know, in the immortal words of Whitney Houston, how do I know? Like, how, how would I know what, pe what people are doing? How do I know what people want? How do I know what people's problems are? How will I know that when I do a thing that they'll actually adopt behavior? Well, we gotta first think about well, who are the people? Like, who are we talking about here? Who, what do we say, what, who are we going after, right? Now, in the case of academia, and this session about demystifying marketing in the, in the academic world, that's an easy one. Students, duh. You know, we're trying to get people to, to come to my class. I'm trying to, I've got a new class on the, on the books. I'm trying to get people to come through or my number, my enrollment numbers are low. I'm trying to get people to come through. Right? Like that's an easy one. We're trying to get students to move, bet. But is it really though? Is it really that easy? Because we tend to lump students in a box, like all students are the same. But we know that the world is quite heterogeneous where everyone is different. And if everyone is di different, then why would we expect that all, all students would be the same because they all tend to be in your in your university, particularly in your school, and maybe in the major that you teach in, the department that you teach in. Not all students are the same, even in the same program or the same major. They're not all the same. So I think about who we're going to go after, who do we want to move. I think about not how do I convince people who normally wouldn't do it. I think the better way to start is identify the collective of the willing. Who are the people that are already in a boat, they just need a reason. People who, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a, like a folk hero in the world of course hero. Um, he teaches a class on, about vampires, right? So if you are a twilight, true blood, uh, fright night aficionado, like you just gotta know the class is offered. You like count me in, I'm there fam. I love a good vampire, right? Like that is, he is, that person is the willing. You convert the willing. That's far easier to do. The idea is that who are the people that are most likely to move? Now in marketing, we refer to that as segmentation. And segmentation is how we take a market that is completely heterogeneous, where everyone is different, and we put them in homogeneous like clusters. They're not the same, but they're more alike than they are different, right? They're more alike than the broader populace or visual way to think about this, that this is the world, this is your university, this is your school where everyone's alike or everyone's different rather, and you're gonna break them up into clusters where they're more alike than they are different, right? So we segment who are the collective of the willing based upon how we segment, right? Makes sense, yes? 
I need thumbs up. I'm constantly need a, there we go. Cool. Sweet. All right. So we divide up the people and identify who would be the, the most willing to move, right? We make a selection. We divide them up, divide up this heterogeneous market into people who are most likely who, who divide them up based on what we feel are characteristics that discriminatingly make them more alike than they are separate. And then we make a selection. Who are we going to go after? Who's the most willing? I think about this as like, uh, as like the high school dance, right? More like the middle school dance. And essentially, the middle school dance, like you see a girl across the way, like she's kind of cute. Man, I love to dance for her, but I'm afraid because what if I dance with her? I ask her to dance and she disses me. Now I feel rejected. My feelings are all hurt, right? Like that's the worst. So what do you do? You hedge your bets, right? We look at her, you say, oh man, she's attractive. And oh, oh man, she's looking at me too. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna shoot my shot. And that's essentially what we do when we target. We looked at attractiveness as far as which segment that we have broken into a homogeneous like cluster is the most attractive for us. So again, if I'm the, the vampire professor, I'm like, yo, these groups of people, they love fantasy, they love uh, horror, they like, obviously this is probably a poor way to, 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 to segment, but for the sake of this conversation, these people, this collective is most attractive to me. And guess what? They're probably most compatible with what I do as well, right? They're probably more compat compatible to what I'm all about. At which point I say, those people I'm gonna go after. I shoot my shot, I make a choice. I ask them to dance, right? Makes sense, yes? Yeah, come on, there we go, cool. All right, so we have successfully segmented the market, took this heterogeneous like market, made homogeneous like clusters. We made a selection of which ones we're gonna go with, which ones we're gonna go after. Right, we made the choice. Now we think about what are we gonna to do to persuade them? And that is, what's the thing that we're gonna stress? The positioning, as we refer to it, STP. What is the positioning that we're gonna to use to get them to move, right? So if I'm the vampire professor and I'm like, yo, everything you know about vampires is wrong. What? No way. All right, I'm taking that class. I need to know, I need to know what's going on, right? Because I know my vampires, right? That is a way to get persuade them. Essentially what we're doing when we are positioning ourselves is we are, we are staking our claim in the cognitive real estate of their mind. That is we're planting our flag in the cognitive, in their, we're, we're in their minds. We are owning cognitive real estate. This right here is us, right? When you think about um, fun classes in the business school, you think about me. When you think about the cool kid on campus, who's the coolest professor? Obviously it's Professor T because his name is Professor T. You think about Professor T. Like, how am I gonna position myself? How do I position my class? So when you're like, man, I'm really looking for a class to end out my, my, my senior year. I don't want it to be too hard, but I want it to be really fun and like rigorous, but like, you know, I get to have a lot of banter. Yo, Professor T's class, I hear his, I hear his class is like super lit. Like his class is so much fun, right? The position that you own in their mind, that's what comes to mind when you are, when people are thinking about what you do. You know, say for instance, so my youngest daughter, Ivy, she's, she's one years old, say, you know, 19 years from now, which breaks my heart to even say it, but 19 years from now, she is a, a sophomore at the University of Michigan because she ain't got a choice, right? Sophomore at the University of Michigan, or maybe she's a junior at that point, at the University of Michigan, and she says, dad, like, I don't want to live in the dorms this year. Me and my homegirls, we, we, we found an apartment where we want to live. And we, we put down, a, we already put down first month's rent. But I need to furnish the place really, really, really fast. And classes start in two days. Help, dad. Now, I love my daughter, but I'm not trying to break the bank on her little, uh, you know, crappy little apartment with her and her friends. Right? So how do I help her furnish her apartment without breaking the bank, but do it very quickly? Where, where, where would you tell me to take her? Where would I go? That's a question mark for you guys. Craigslist. Yeah. Craigslist. Right. So Craigslist, I don't want her to die because Craigslist is super sketchy. But Ikea, Ikea. right? That sounds about right. right? Let Ikea. go is really good. Yeah. So the idea is that when you think about that problem, that, that issues, companies start to come to mind. Brands start to come to mind because they own that cognitive real estate in your head. Right. And that's exactly what you want to do. That becomes the position. And it's through segmenting the market, taking a market where all these students are different and put them in homogeneous like clusters that are discriminating. It's more than just, you know, they're juniors because not all juniors are going to care about the vampire class, for instance, but there's something about them that makes them more like 
that actually aligns to what would essentially make the move, which is important for us because we want them to do, we want them to move. Then we shoot our shot, we make a selection, who we want to go after. And then we find the vehicle we're going to use to persuade them. Then we're going to stress, right? Now, with all that in mind, like that, that's, that, those are the mechanisms that we go through to get people to move, to make good marketing. But then it begs the question, well, well what makes it good then? Right, I, I, I identified the people I want to go after. I've, I've, sh I've shot my shot. I, I did some strong positioning. How do I know if it's good? Pam, how, how do I know? So uh, Pam, I, I rehired you back onto my team to do marketing for me. Pam was just going to do a market research. She's going to find out stuff and let people know what we got, find out information. And Pam says, oh, my bad. You want to sell some things. Okay, great. So I hire Pam back on. Pam, what makes good marketing then? Um, people buying what you're selling. Or if I'm running for mayor and you are my, uh, my, my head of marketing, what makes good marketing? Um, people interested in wanting to vote for you or giving you their promise to vote. Is it just a promise though? Well, I mean, at the very end, it would be voting for you, yeah, but- I want the votes. Don't yeah. give me no promises. I want your vote, <laughs> right? That, that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna gauge you on, Pam. At the end of this thing, if, I, if I'm like, yo, I, we, we lost by like 12 points. And you say, but everybody promised me though, Marcus. Not good enough, right? Like good marketing, marketing, marketing that we refer to as good is marketing that gets people to move. And I refer to it this way. In a world where ideas are plentiful, it's the ones that get people to move that win. It's the ones that get people to adopt behavior that wins. Why? Because that is the core function of marketing. That is what we are here to do, to get people to move. Now, here's the, the, the million dollar question. How do we do that? How, like, how do we get people to move? What do we, how am I as a marketer, or in this case, you know, if you're a professor or your head or your uh, administrator or whatever in the organization, your, your university, how do I get people to move? And then, so that to me begs another question. When you look out onto your campus, imagine you're physically there, you're not, you know, shut down by COVID. Imagine you're physically there on campus and it's fall, it's before the flu season, so maybe school will still be open because it definitely shut down in October. But it's, you know, it's, it's before flu season, everyone's in the newness of the day and you're looking around campus. What do you see? Who do you see? What do you see walking around campus? What do you see as you walk around campus? You have mute, Mary. What do you see? Students. <laughs> students. Okay, that's right. Yeah, you see some students. Trace, some what do you see? What do you see? see professors? Yes, Trace, what do you see? I see, you know, student orgs trying to get you to like take their flyers and yeah, people passing out flyers. Yeah, Katie, mm -hmm. what do you see? Um, staff, librarians, delivery people. Yep, yeah, delivery people, librarians. Kev, how about you? What do you see, Kevin? Um, you gotta mute yourself. No, there you staff, students, um, you know, employees, I mean, same people that people have already identified. Yeah, you see, some, you see people, you see buildings, you see cars going by, people getting food, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, totally. See, I don't see it that way though. I see an uncontrollable environment. <laughs> I see a messy, crazy environment that I have zero control over as a marketer. I don't control these people. I don't, I don't control professors. I don't control students. I don't control librarians. That was very specific, Katie. I don't control librarians. I don't control the people who, who, uh, who, who are giving out flyers, Sharice. I don't trust, I don't, I don't control the restaurants. I don't have no control. It's a messy, messy, messy environment. It's a crazy, messy business environment that I see as a marketer. But I do have control over four things. The product that I bring to market, I have control over the price, that is the exchange rate that I set it. I have control over the place, that is the pipeline by which I deliver my product. And I have control over the way I promote it. That's it, that's all, but one, but they call it the seven, these are the four Ps. That's what we refer to as the seven Ps now, because I have control over the physical environment, control over the people that I hire, and I have control over the processes that I go through. But for the sake of you know, this one thing, let's say with the four Ps, right? So I have control over these things, my product, what I priced it, the place that is the, the pipeline that by which I deliver it, and 
the way I promote it. Like, this is my control. That's it. Everything else is outside of my control. It's a messy, nasty, uncontrollable world that we live in. It's a beautiful world, but it's be a beautiful mess, right? And all I can do is try to navigate it based on what I can control. This is how we get people to move. So let's talk about what these things are quickly so I can leave some room for questions. So the first is the product, right? And the product in this case, we're talking about academia, we're talking about your course and how you teach it. What you bring to market, your product offering, in this case, your product service, closer product service than product good, is the course and how you teach it. So if I can control that, the best I can do is to optimize that offering. And this is why offering optimization is so important because what we put in the world is powerful, right? And the way we communicate it is helpful. But when other people talk about it, and to Mary's point earlier, that's when things get really good. And the things that we, that we offer, they, there aren't, they aren't, um, are not all things are created equal. For instance, some professors say, you know, I, you know, I, I, I landed all my material, like all, all my stuff was buttoned up and I got just like, okay, evaluations, man, what is that? It's like, well, you just did your job, fam. Like, what do you expect? Like you met their expectations. Like you want a cookie for that? Like that's what you're supposed to do. It's like the pizza delivery person coming and saying, yo, the, the, the pizza's hot. Can I get a tip? Fam, it's supposed to be hot. You did your job. What do you want from me? Or maybe you exceeded expectations that like, you know, the pizza was hot and it was a little early. Oh, thank God. I'm going to give you an extra dollar for that. Appreciate it. Right? Like, you know, you, uh, you know, the class was, was, was conducted in a, you know, smooth like fashion. And, you know, it was pretty, I, I, I wasn't bored, which I'm normally in bored in class. Thanks, professor. Okay. But it's the classes that not just exceed expectations, but create new expectations that we talk about, not we, that our students talk about. They are remarkable. And by definition, they are worthy of a remark. They're worth talking about it. People go like, yo, Sharice, you got to take Professor T's class. Like, yo, I... I walked in thinking I was gonna get this and it completely blew my mind. We can control that by delivering the right product to the right people so that their expectations are identified and we can create new expectations around them. Makes sense, yes? Yes, sweet, all right, cool. So then the next is price, right? And price really is just the rate of exchange. We all think like rate of exchange is like the amount of money I'll pay for the product but you know rate exchange is also time right like uh it took me forever to watch the ozark which i'm like into season three and it is phenomenal but it took me forever to start watching it because i was like two seasons behind i'm like fam like that's a lot of hours to get caught up but how many episodes 10 episodes in each season dude that's 20 hours i can i got a life b i can't do that right it, the rate of exchange for me to get up to speed no matter how good it was and it is good was just too high for me to handle at that point in my life right now, when it comes to the classes you teach, oftentimes you can't even control that, right? There's a slot, there's three hours, there's 90 minutes, there's one hour, whatever the case may be, you are slotted for that. You can't control that. So let's just move past that, right? But you get that. That's price. Yes? Yes? Price? Sweet. All right. This place. Now, place is probably the wrong way to think about this, but, you know, I'm, I'm not Jerome McCarthy, and he's the one who came up with the, the, the marketing mix back in 1956, but... Joe McCarthy said, called it place because you got three P's. Markers love alliterations and we love work. So P's use the word place. And place is not the location, not the retail location. Place really is the pipeline. This is the means by which we get the product to the people. It's distribution, right? How do we get it to them? Now, in this case, you actually may have a little bit more uh, freedom as, as product deliverers, as course deliverers, because maybe you say, I'm going to teach my class completely remote. But if like that's the best way to get it to, to students than the physical, which is a, 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 a mashup mash between the product and how the product gets to them. But that's a little bit outside the scope, so let's keep moving on. But you get me on, on place, yes? Yep, you get me on place? Yep, cool. Then there's the coveted promotions. And promotion essentially is how we communicate it. It's like, what are, what are, what are we gonna say? How do we articulate the positioning? How do we talk about, to Mary's point, these are the products we got. How do we tell people? What do we say? 
And we think about promotion, we think about the partnerships, think about the people, think about the advertising, think about the public relations. And, you know, and I trapped Mary in this one. This was purposeful. I'm sorry, Mary. But like immediately we think that, oh, is marketing a choice? Well, I guess I could choose not to do an ad and do, mark and do uh, word of mouth instead. But that's just one fourth of what it means to go to market, of what we can control. If we think about the four Ps, right? To Mary's point earlier, you can choose not to do any advertising, any marketing communications, and just rely on the product, the way you get the product to the people on exchange rate, and rely on people talking about how great the product is because of how remarkable it is. I think it's fascinating that before 2015, Uber never had a CMO, a chief marketing officer. So in their first four to five years of, of existence, no one was responsible for marketing communications at Uber. Why? Because we marketed Uber for them. We told people about Uber themselves. We we're like, yo, why are you trying to get a, a car in New York? Black man, ain't nobody gonna pick you up. You had a black car service in your pocket, use your phone. You're like, oh word, this is so dope, oh my goodness. I tell everybody about it, right? So you could, quite frankly, never use marketing communications. There are a lot of brands who, who don't. Brands who are big and that we love, like Costco, hardly use any marketing communications. They rely on Katie saying, why are you playing yourself going to Target? You can go to Costco and get all Kirkland brand and it's amazing, right? So the idea here, when we think about marketing communications, is that we can use a push strategy or a pull strategy. The push strategy is that, you know, I'm going to tell my customers about what I have, right? Pam said, this is what I got. And this is why it's so good. Come and get it. Come get it. It's, it's amazing. Come get it. And at best, I say at best, but most, more than likely, my ability to get people to move is going to match demand, right? The demand I'm able to drum up will be the, the amount of product, the amount of service I'll be able to offer. So in, this, in the case of the class, right? I teach her, I have an idea for a new class. I think it's gonna be so amazing. I did market research, I think it's gonna be so awesome. I go to my department and say, I wanna, I wanna teach this class. And they say, okay, that sounds cool. Seems like that'll be a good part of the pedagogy for, uh, for students' uh, time here, their narrative here. Let's give the offering They tell all the students, hey, you wanna know about SEL, uh, search engine optimization? It's gonna be so important for your career. And we give them all the reasons why it matters. And students who are like, I don't even think about SEL, but I guess that's important. Maybe I'll take it, right? And essentially the demand of people who show up are probably, you know, just going to meet however, you know, however loud we, we preach the gospel. When we think about a pull strategy, that's when students come to you and say, I want to know about SEO. Please make a class for this. At which point, you know, everything you do is based on demand. So, you know, people are going to be there. Not only that, you know, there is, if you're a product good, there is no access inventory. But if you're a product service, like a school, we know that the, the, the enrollment is going to be full. If we match the enrollment, what people are asking for. Makes sense. Yes. With me. Yes. So that's it. That, that, that is how we do it. It's, you know, we, we, we do a mix of we product of the price that is the exchange rate, the place, the pipeline, which we get it to them and how we communicate it. Now, here's the thing. Neither one of these things alone are great. You can have an amazing product, but getting it to people is a mess, so no one can ever get at it, so who cares? Or it's so dumb expensive that no one's ever gonna buy it. Or it's priced so cheap that no one believes the product is that good, so you never buy it, right? Or you don't communicate it and no one talks about it, so no one goes and buy, right? So one by itself is never enough. I think of it this way. If I hand you a stick of butter and say, take a bite, you like, this is disgusting. Or I said, hey, put your hand in this flour and stuff it in your mouth. You'd say, that's not good either. Or here's a bunch of sugar. We all love sugar. We're all addicted to sugar. Just jam this in your mouth. Disgusting. Eat a raw egg. Disgusting. But put them all together. You got awesome this cake, right? And that's how we go to market. Right? It's a mix of all these things that get us to amazingness. This is the marketing mix. And this is how we get people to overcome the obstacle, the delta between what their current, what we want them to do, what we would set out with success, 
what they're currently doing, what's keeping them from moving. We use these four Ps, these, these levers, these controllables that we have to overcome it. So my recommendation for you, so you can leave a little bit of time, um, is this. Don't focus on pro promoting your class. Focus on activating the network of people. Activate the collective of the willing. Find the people who are like, yo, like I, I'm all about that. Whatever your thing is, whatever your positioning is, whatever the cognitive flag you put in people's brains are, whatever that is, focus on that. And what you do, instead of the normal like target audience marketing where I shout at a bunch of people and maybe a few people actually pay attention to what I say, then maybe a small percentage of those people actually move. Instead of doing that, talk to the people who are most likely to move, the collective of the willing. Go preach the gospel to them. So you are the, uh, the vampire boy, the vampire professor. You go talk to the Twilight folks, the team Edwards and the team uh, Jacobs. And be like, yo, I'm teaching this, this class. It's going to challenge everything you think you know about uh, vampires. It's going to borrow from like, what, the, te what the, the movies got right and what they got wrong and the history of all of it. And then they're going to lose their effing minds. And then when their friends say, yo, what class are you taking this semester? It's like, yo, I'm taking the vampire class. They're like, the vampire class? Like, yo, the vampire class is going to be like that. And they'd be like, man, you so amped about the vampire class. Man, let's go check out the vampire class. You should check out the vampire class. And before long, everybody in Mama has signed up for the vampire class. And here's what we know about this from network theory. As Krasakis and Fowler puts it, is that when a small group of people begin to act in concert displaying visible symptoms, the epidemic can spread along social network ties via emotional contagion and large groups become quickly synchronized. Or as Durkheim puts it, that they move in solidarity. To, they move in concert to promote solidarity through what he refers to as collective effervescence. And this is, this is at its core of what it means to be human, right? Aristotle said it best, man by nature is a social animal. We are. We move in packs and we identify, we look at what other people are doing to get a sense of what we should do, whether it's through social proof, whether it's due norming, whether it's due evaluation and legitimation, we get a sense of what people like me should do. And those are the segments that we want to go after. Those are the people that we want to activate. So if we can activate people who are like them and get them to go preach the gospel on our behalf, they move. Now, do they move in droves right away? Nope. They don't. That's the trade-off. It takes a little bit of time, but that time that it takes is far more sustainable and requires less resources than shouting at people, telling them why your class is so great. You just take my class, it's all about valuations of uh, finance. And you're like, dude, I'm going to HR. I don't care about finance. Stop yelling at me, which is basically what advertising does to you on a daily basis, day -day basis. or if you're online, it you know stalks you across the web saying you looked at my shoes buy my shoes I'm like i didn't want it when i saw it please leave me alone if i come in blue or come in purple etc right makes sense yes yes awesome so um i hope this was helpful um at the very least i hope that it helps you see the world a little bit differently as you think about your classes think about the programs that you run or the departments that you work in the schools you work in the university that you're at like Whatever your goal is, whatever your objective is, and why marketing might be of importance to you, I hope that this helps provide a lens by which you see the world and maybe change the way you see the world a bit so you can operate in the world a little differently as well. So what I'll do is I'll stop my screen here. Uh, that's my information if you need to get in touch. And I will open up for questions for the eight minutes that we have. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. So any questions? And if you don't have any, I won't be offended, by the way. Thank you, Marcus. That was a great talk. Say it again. Just put your information up again. Oh, okay, yeah. I have a question. What I'll do is I'll put it in the chat so it's there for everyone. Okay, can you hear me? I have a question. What's up, Jody? Hi, I couldn't get my um, picture in. It said the host wouldn't let me. <laughs> That's okay. The world is better off not seeing me. Um, I'm wondering, I'm the director of the media program, so it's not just promoting one class. It's promoting a program. Yeah. So when you're talking about collecting the willing, do you see it more um, really focusing, let's say on high schools and their media instructors rather than a bigger picture? Also, do you see, in terms of gathering the willing, do you see it easier to see people in person or it's a digital world and social media? If your willing is more likely to be 
engaged in social media, you know, it's not just uh, who are you willing, but it's the where do they live? Totally. Yeah, so yes, a bunch of questions there. So let's try to unpack them um, in a very succinct way. Yeah. So you, you don't have a class, a product, you have a suite of products, right? Which is not unlike what a lot of brands have, you know, like- That's a program, you know, right? A program, right, exactly. So your program has a suite of products, right? Product offerings. So you can either go at, you go at a product level that I want people to take this class. How do I market this class? Or you can say, I have this program that I want people to be a part of. How do I market this program? So, so I know you're at, at LTU, um, and there are several, in the media lab, there are several different tracks that people can go. You right. can say, hey, I want to get people to join this part of the school, right? So join our psychology department, for instance. Um, and I want people to be on this track within the psychology department. That is the, that is the perspective by which I'm going to market. Now, what do I want people to do with that in mind? Do I want them to come check out the website to see what we got? Like that's the behavior you need to adopt because they don't know anything about us. That's why they're not enrolling. So the first step is get people to just check it out. And then step two is now they checked it out, get people to do another action, right? And it may take, you know, multiple steps to get them to actually, you know, pull the trigger. But the same thing we would do at a for singular product is the same thing we would do at a program level as well. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because so, it means sometimes you have many actions. Right. And, and it's always that way. Like no one sees a car commercial and is like, bet 35 grand, pay for it right now. Like you're like, well, that's interesting. And then you see someone driving it. Then you see, you know, you see a billboard for it. You see someone, you, so you talk about it to someone. Then you go check it out. Like there's so many different uh, touch points that lead, that, that are part of the attribution to you making a move. And what a marketer does is like, what what is the... The consumer journey and what are the, the the touch points that I want to get nudge people along the way to get them to actually consume whatever that consumption is. So in the case of, of Pam, I want her to get votes from me, but if Pam may say the first thing you need to get people to sign a pledge saying that they will vote. Sweet. Okay. That's the first behavior we're going to design for. Then once they made the pledge, now how do we activate them to make sure they show up to the polls? Right? So you know what I mean? So you identify what is the behavior you want people to do and identify where you might find those people, which requires you doing a really good job of segmenting. Mm -hmm. um, Marcus, there are two questions that are coming into chat right now. One is from Paul. I see, uh, I see MDLC got a question. He had his hand up. So let's go to him. Okay. Then we'll do the two in the chat. Cool. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi, Marcus. So the question was, you introduced the four P's, and so I'm thinking about the letter that comes after P, which is Q, thinking about yeah. quality. And there's this way in which the analogy you made earlier about buying furniture for your daughter, right? And the question got posed and everybody said Ikea. But the idea is that part of the trade-off is with Ikea, you're obviously thinking to yourself, there's a particular price point and I'm paying for particular quality. And if I wanted a different kind of quality, I'd have to pay a different price point for that, right? Sure. So in thinking about this in terms of, again, our work in classes and courses, et cetera, similarly thinking about pricing slash maybe ease or innovation, somebody may want to take the easy class because that's just the way they're not going to get an A in that class. It's done and over with. I fit the requirement. The super yeah. shiny, new, the, the shiny, new, interesting, innovative idea might not be the way that in and of itself may not be enough to necessarily propel somebody to want to register for it. So question about... Q and we're oh, Q yeah. So, so you know, equality is like super subjective, like unbelievably subjective. For instance, um, say someone's going to buy a pair of headphones and they, they, they go into Target or Best Buy and they're in the electronic aisle and all the headphones are on the rack. They all look the same, all same sort of shape. Um, you know, some, the only difference is the, the brand name. Which brand are people most likely to buy, you think? Uh, the one that they recognize as uh, the most popular or the one that everybody else has usually because people probably usually beats by Dre, right? Like, yeah, probably Beats by Dre. Now, sure. is Beats by Dre better than Bose? <laughs> Absolutely not. Not yeah. even close. It's a completely inferior product. Okay. However, Beats by Dre owned 48% of the market share, mm -hmm. right? In fact, someone dissected a pair of Beats by Dre headphones and found that it only costs $17 to make a $200 pair of Beats by Dre headphone, mm -hmm. right? It's not good quality, but what is good, right? Like 
you know, uh, Clay Christian talks about this as the job to be done. Sometimes the job to be done is functional, that I want a high-end response that only a bolus can give me. Sometimes the job to be done is emotional, that I want to feel a certain way when I have them on. I want to feel like I'm somebody. And then there's a social job. I want people to look at me and think of me as somebody, that I would actually buy an inferior product that makes me look cool and make me feel cool because that is what I value. And value is, again, just an unbelievably uh, subjective word. So to the point about, about quality is that quality like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And if you can shape the, the public discourse that it's worth it because it's so cool or it's worth it because all the language I, that, that I learned in this class, I got a job from it. Like all of these things that add value is what makes it quote unquote quality. Because truthfully, if we're being totally trill that like, a lot of things that we teach, even this, what I just did right now, like I teach on a Coursera for free. You know, you know, is it worth paying what people pay to, to sit in our classes and hear us pontificate about things that are only esoteric in some, in some ways? Maybe it depends. It depends on how you evaluate, how you value um, the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Okay. You got it. So there's two questions. Yeah. One from Paul. Quickly. Paul has been very patient. Oh, Paul, um, what you got? Oh, what's oh, yeah. the difference what between said? activating the network and word of mouth? So I would say activating the network is the byproduct of word of mouth. So word of mouth is the mechanism by which the network is activated, right? So I want to get these people to move. I get the people within that collective, within that network to start talking. And as a result, they move in concert to promote social solidarity. So mm -hmm. word of mouth is, the, it is the, the mechanism, it is the behavior that people exhibit in an effort to catalyze network, um, network coordination. Mm -hmm. There's another question from Katie. Okay. All right, we'll make this the last one. Mm -hmm. All right, what's your advice Katie. on active? Oh, oh, Katie, you want to ask me? You want me to just read it? case like i don't care all right what's your advice on activating student networks now that we're all in a virtual pandemic mode and overwhelmed and not meeting in person etc you know so uh, uh jody mentioned this earlier that like that's a social networking platform before i mean this, this is the beauty about technology in a very marshall McLuhan way and without like you know getting too much because i can do non sequiturs pretty easily marshall McLuhan said that technology merely extends human behavior it only pushes forward what we already do, right? The glasses are just extensions of the eyes, clothes are extensions of the skin, the tire, the wheel extension of the foot, right? All these technologies, these innovations are, or inventions are extensions of normal behavior. Social networking platforms by that very logic is an extension of our normal social networks, our friends, our families, our teammates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, classmates, our people. So the same sort of mechanisms, though the context is different, but the same core behavior that happens when we coordinate with our people happens in these other social mediums, these other vehicles by which we connect. Word of mouth happens the same way. In fact, I would argue that it's accelerated through a Facebook-like environment when I see everybody in my network who is like me do a thing. In fact, me going through my news feed is sort of giving me receipts on what is acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that, you know, we design for what we normally do in a physical world and the zeros and ones is merely gasoline uh, on, on the spark that we create. All right, so I know I went over my time, but you have my information, you have a question, send me an email, shoot me a tweet, send a raven, I don't care, whatever you need to do, get in touch. Thank you, everyone. Um, Take care. This was fantastic. Bye. <laughs> so much fun.